Hello and welcome to Perfecting the Prequels, Revenge of the Sif. Um, I assume that most of you will come to this video having seen the two previous Perfecting the Prequels on Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, which have stemmed from a stream with Nathan Hood on fixing the prequels. So I'm not going to rehash um, everything from there. And I will just get into focusing on the summary of the original ideas that were brought forth in the Fixing the Prequel stream. Before I'm, and during this, I will add necessary context, and then I will come to uh, my additions um, towards the end. The original redraft begins by focusing on the text crawl that men all across the galaxy have been enlisting, enlisting to defend the Republic against the clone army, and Palpatine has assumed the role of charismatic leader and war chief. Nevertheless, the forces of both sides have reached an uneasy stalemate. One decisive victory will determine the outcome of the Clone Wars. Uh, what we both decided very quickly is that General Grievous's character is scrapped uh, in favour of Maul, who obviously is still alive in this version. And the battle scene over Coruscant is projected further into the film. The first act hinges on the military campaign in Kashyyyk, the Wookiee planet, and whether the Republic can kill Maul and finally go on the final offensive. Uh, it is not necessary to completely remove Grievous. I mean, you can have him as you know, a, a random captain or some sort of a, a general sort of antagonist. But in terms of that uh, general role obtained by the uh, separatists, it's not going to be Grievous, it's very much going to be Maul. Um, indeed, I think people watching this will probably agree that Grievous was a character who was not previously established and um, almost seems inexplicable in terms of continually introducing um, major antagonists very late into the series without due context, especially as you kill off uh, Dooku at the beginning of the film, uh, who is a very interesting character, but simultaneously he doesn't really have that much uh, development. But uh, continuing on, despite the creation of a Grand Republic army, uh, Queen Padme Amidala has remained resolute in her defense of Naboo's independence and has created a distinct Naboo army comprising of Naboo citizens and Gungans under her and Anakin's leadership, um, ever wary of the encroachments of the Separatists and Palpatine. And if you want, you can include uh, Jar Jar Binks in this. Uh, he played an important role in my uh, my Phantom Menace redraft, but um, uh, you can still have him there. I don't see any reason why not. For Padme, this represents a culmination of her character, from a terrified and overwhelmed child, monarch, to a war leader. On Kashyyyk, the Nemoidians have enslaved the Wookiees. Just to add context to this from that stream, this is a desperate gambit to extract resources and control the population. In fighting the Separatists here, Anakin sees the Republic army as a vehicle for ending slavery echoing his own experience and affirming his dedication to the army and Palpatine's leadership. And again, to add extra context to this, Padme can see this transformation in Anakin and is wary that she is losing some of her influence over him to Palpatine, which is obviously foreshadowing for what happens at the end of the film. Noting Luke's historical allusions, I think there is an obvious parallel in the original Clone Wars to the war between the states, even to the name Confederacy of Independent Systems, obviously referring to the American South. Uh, you can even say that Christopher Lee's portrayal of Dooku might even be a sub subtle nod to Robert E. Lee. I'm not sure about that, but definitely um, in the look and in his sort of role as war chief, perhaps. Um, indeed, you know, from Lucas's point of view, the fallen Jedi, um, one sort of idea that cropped up, but I'm not going to lean too much into that. Indeed, ironically, uh, Palpatine could be viewed as the Abraham Lincoln in this situation. This is either something Lucas overlooked, or indeed it could be a fascinating piece of historical revisionism from Lucas, but it's almost certainly the former. Uh, Nathan's added slavery component here uh, to the Kashyyyk campaign compounds this historical analogy. Moving on, Anakin and Obi-Wan successfully find and dispatch Maul, and Queen Padme Amidala assumes that the war is all but over. 
this is essentially D-Day as another allusion to the Kashyyyk campaign. Anakin and Obi-Wan returned to Coruscant to strategize the final defeat of the Separatists. Instead, there is a power struggle within the Jedi Council, with Kiadi Mundi, remember the leader of the conservative faction of the Jedi, anxious to see the Republic army disbanded, lest it become a permanent fixture. The Jedi would rather things revert to the antebellum pre-war status quo than become usurped by Chancellor Palpatine, and that would necessitate ousting Palpatine should he refuse to give up his emergency powers and surrender his office. Nevertheless, this perception of Palpatine is not unanimous among the Jedi. Yoda sees the Jedi have become a force for good in fighting to restore the Republic. Other Jedi believe that Kiadi Mundi's allies are extremely naive if they think they can remove Palpatine now, who has a galaxy-spanning army under his command. Anakin was summoned back to Coruscant not to help end the war, as was his assumption, but to spy on the Chancellor at which point it becomes apparent to Anakin that the Council view the Chancellor as a greater threat than the Separatists, something that causes Anakin great distress and stretches his loyalty to the absolute extreme. Moreover, sending Anakin to spy on the Chancellor is a tacit acknowledgement by the Jedi that he is wavering. It is a deliberate test of loyalty, spying on Anakin, spying on Palpatine. Anakin is aware of this, but he has no obvious solution to this conundrum whereby he has to remain loyal to the Chancellor and the Council. Indeed, all of these, adding context to these characters, what I'm hoping, and what Nathan and I hoped to achieve here is giving Anakin his own agency, because Hayden Christensen is, weirdly enough, a very passive character beyond his aspirations for further power, and frankly, he comes across like a bit of an idiot. Um, this version of Anakin has an incredible amount of foresight, his own perception of what the Republic is, of what the Jedi are, and what his own role in all of this is. And he has to deal with all of these conflicted loyalties, and it's tearing him apart like we see in the film, albeit he has a far more uh, nuanced and you can, he's far more cognizant of all of these factors and takes them into his overall equation. In addition, as with the films, Anakin has visions of Padme's death. Though this is uh, not an allusion to death in childbirth, as in the films. The first redraft with Nathan indicated that the death may be in battle. But looking back at my Phantom Menace stream, Anakin is having flashbacks to Padme in stasis when she was corrupted by the dark influence of Darth Pelagius. And this is a foreshadowing that Padme's death will be at the hands of a dark side force user, Anakin. As in the films, Anakin seeks out Yoda, then Palpatine. In the films, it is not clear whether Yoda is even aware of Anakin and Padme's marriage, which coupled with his advice to let go of everything Anakin fears to lose is a damning indictment of Yoda's intelligence and force ability, to put it mildly. Indeed, I don't really understand what Lucas wanted out of Yoda in the original prequel series, um, other than to simply have him there wielding his little green lightsaber and offering meaningless platitudes. I really don't know, but it's really rather disappointing. In the redraft, Anakin approaches Yoda because Yoda is already invested in the couple because he married them, not just because Yoda is a Jedi. But even then, Yoda can only say to Anakin that he is sensing a future that can be, not one that will be, and he cautions Anakin, patience, wait until the war is over. It is then that a fearful Anakin goes to Palpatine. Here Nathan and I discussed Palpatine's manipulation or seduction of Anakin as stemming from a gift of greater power, i.e. Faustian, as relayed in the films as the story of Pelagius and his healing powers. It was ultimately agreed that for the sake of the consistency of Anakin's character, in order that he doesn't betray everything he believes just for Padme, that this Faustian element to make a pact with the devil had to be de-emphasized somewhat, a decision I will elaborate on at the end of the stream. The redraft instead focuses more on emotional manipulation. Palpatine feeds into Anakin's aspiration for independence vis-a-vis -vis slavery. He cultivates a father-son relationship and gives him advice that would never be countenanced by the Jedi. Then Palpatine attacks the rules of the Jedi, saying something like this, you know Anakin, 
that the Jedi are plotting to have me removed. When I am gone, the Jedi will force you to abandon Padme. Do you believe they will ever forgive you for breaking one of the core tenets of the Jedi Code? With Padme gone, you will no longer be able to protect her. Indeed, were the monastic rules of celibacy to be reimposed, Anakin knows that he stands to lose absolutely everything. Anakin at this point has an inkling of something wrong. He does not believe Palpatine to be a Sith. Indeed, going back to the Phantom Menace redraft, this is a conviction that Palpatine cannot be a Force user because Anakin's own experience is with the totalizing and corrupting influence of dark, Darth Plagueis' dark side force powers. How can these two completely uh, antithetical forces be from the same source, which is the Sith? Again, from Anakin's own personal experience, this simply cannot be the case. And all of this does is actually to strengthen Palpatine's case, because Palpatine's consistent most powerful passive ability is his ab ability to shield himself um, from the rest of the Jedi. Something that, say, for example, Darth Maul, or just Maul in this instance, uh, fails at completely. Uh, meanwhile, Count Dooku, since the death of Maul, suspects that the Separatist cause has been compromised, that the Republic are consistently aware of extremely sensitive information to the point that Dooku deduces that the dark side aspect and Palpatine are one and the same. Dooku then captures Palpatine. Uh, this wasn't elaborated on the original redraft, but I will be going into this in more depth. For Dooku, this is a final and, dare I say, brilliant ploy to destroy the Republic and win the war for the Separatists. Dooku arrives at Coruscant with the entire remaining Separatist fleet and announces to the Senate and Jedi Council that Palpatine is a dark lord of the Sith. By saying this, Dooku believes that he will create a civil war in the Republic between the Jedi and the army. Were that to fail, and the Republic remains resolutely behind the Chancellor, Dooku could ransom him back to Coruscant and return for favourable concessions to the Separatists. The presence of the Separatist fleet above Coruscant would place further pressure on any Republic negotiators. Some Jedi are convinced, along with Anakin, that Dooku is only saying this for the sake of dividing them, and that they should attempt to save Palpatine regardless. However, Kiadi Mundi is convinced, or rather has chosen to believe, that Dooku is correct, and orders all the Jedi to stand down, believing that Dooku has resolved their Palpatine problem for them, and he should just die, or be permanently incarcerated. This stand-down order would extend to any army units with Jedi officers integrated into them. Anakin, regardless, defies this order, marking his ultimate breach with the Jedi Council, unwilling to let the Chancellor and everything the Chancellor represents die due to the self-preservationist attitudes of the Jedi. Obi-Wan confronts Anakin over this, but ultimately, Obi-Wan concedes that he has no argument to present to Anakin, other than to simply obey the orders of the Jedi Council. Deep down, Obi-Wan believes that Dooku is right, but he cannot see any positive outcome arriving out of the situation. In a powerful character moment, Obi-Wan lets Anakin go, not because he believes Anakin is necessarily right, but because he believes Anakin is going with the best of intentions, and the greatest gift Obi-Wan can give Anakin at this time is the freedom to make his own decision even if he doesn't believe it is the right decision. Anakin is able to get onto the capital flagship, is able to kill Dooku and rescue Palpatine, after which Palpatine assuages Anakin's concerns with the Jedi in saying, we shall descend to Coruscant as victors. Should the Jedi object, we shall hear the terms they present to us. Palpatine, ever anxious to co-opt and seduce Anakin into believing he has chosen the side of the righteous. The two return to the planet, having won the war, to what they expect will be a public triumph. Believing Dooku was right, and that the Palpatine may be a Sith, a group of Jedi led by Mace Windu immediately confront Palpatine. Palpatine, who is at the apex of his popularity and power, in what could be their last ever chance to arrest him and remove him from power. A desperate and impolitic gambit, and I would hope something which is far more dramatic than meeting him in his office. Palpatine rebuffs Windu, 
appealing to the devoted crowd around him and refusing to recognize the authority of the Jedi to arrest him. It is then that Mace draws his lightsaber, swings it at the Chancellor, only to be maimed by Anakin and killed, while the other Jedi are attacked by the crowd. The crowd turn into a lynch mob, incensed that the Jedi attempted to murder the heroic Chancellor and then storm the Jedi Temple, while Anakin is sent off to kill Ki Mundi, lest the Jedi regroup and reignite the civil war. From Anakin's perspective, from Dooku to Mace Windu and now Ki Mundi, all he sees are fallen Jedi, all enemies of the Republic and of galactic peace. For the Jedi, this represents a damnation in memory. The Jedi are the harbingers of the end of the Republic, while Palpatine, despite forming the Empire, is responsible for saving it. The war on the Jedi, moreover, becomes a Republic-wide war on religion and the Force. Leagues of the Militant Godless, a campaign which is so successful that a mere 20 years later, top-ranking Imperial officers are mocking Vader for his devotion to that sad old religion. Any intimation that Palpatine is a Force user is forbidden in public. Indeed, he is the figure seen as the enemy of the Force and all Force users, despite, of course, him being a Force user. Yoda, as the exception among the slain Jedi, is captured and tortured by Palpatine, making Yoda a more valorous character, escaping Sidious, rather than the author of a failed assassination attempt. Obi-Wan returns to Naboo to see Padme, who has just given birth to Leia and Luke. Together, they are concerned about the rise of the Empire and the situation with Anakin, though with the exception of Yoda, Padme is ambivalent to the destruction of the Jedi, as they had attempted to keep herself and Anakin apart. Indeed, in this draft, Padme doesn't really understand what the dark side is. But of course, given the rewrite of the Phantom Menace in the updated version of this, Padme is very cognizant about the implications, severe implications of falling to the dark side, given her own experience with Darth Plagueis. Padme and Obi-Wan travel to Mustafa and Anakin becomes so enraged that both Padme and Obi-Wan are attempting to manipulate um, him to go against the Chancellor. Padme attempts to break up a fight between them, only to be killed in the crossfire. The death of Padme fully immerses Anakin in the dark side, and he then attempts to murder Obi-Wan. You can probably see that there isn't actually a lot of meat given to the third act of the film um, after the attack on the Jedi. Um, and that is because Nathan and I were very much playing with ideas. There wasn't very much in terms of the actual hard logistics of how all of these events will transpire. And what I'm hoping to do with the ideas I'm going to present now is actually find a very sort of consistent order of scenes um, in order to contextualize all of these events and indeed add meat to them. So beginning at the um, at, indeed you can say the events before the film uh going back to these which are now the additions i'm making here from that original scene uh that original stream at the beginning of the war it should be made obvious that the republic is at a distinct disadvantage because they are relying on conscripts and indeed reluctant jedi officers against the clones the darth maul clones who are far more intimidating than the jango fett clones and the separatist systems um, and the separatists comprise the most militant races in the galaxy indeed the nemoidians essentially were a um a sort of a droid army monolith but um, all of this, from a thematic point of view, is actually to show the Republic, despite having more numbers, uh, are effectively the underdogs. They are, they have the, the Republic has no military tradition whatsoever. Um, it really is a force for internal peacekeeping, if it has any sort of forces at all. And that is why the Republic has been so weak in the face of rampant corruption, uh, because it doesn't have the hard power to be able to enforce policy. Um, the totalizing opposite, or the total opposite of this, is of course, when at the beginning of A New Hope, Palpatine is able to force all of the systems into a state of submission through the use of the Death Star. So. Palpatine comes in with no army, and he ends with the ultimate source of power in the universe. 
in terms of you can say his ultimate victory before the rebellion are ultimately and surprisingly able to defeat him. Palpatine, of course, himself has largely negated this advantage because of his diplomacy. He has been able to woo individual systems back into the Republic piecemeal in return for blanket amnesty. As the Republic becomes more centralized under Palpatine, the separatists devolve into infighting. Indeed, Maul effectively represents a power unto himself, something both Dooku and the other separatists had hoped to avoid. As I mentioned at the end of the Clone Wars stream, Maul and Dooku have been left in this position of a uneasy diarchy, and the clones have, in a sense, gone rogue from their original conception as the new army of the Nemoidians after the failure of the original clone of the original droid campaign uh, on Naboo and the Phantom Menace. And just referencing this image I have up here, Palpatine has become a regular fixture at Jedi Council meetings alongside Mazameda, building on the precedent established during the Phantom Menace redraft. In the film, it is ambiguous as to how the war is run, as Palpatine and the Council appear to operate separately. In this redraft, and that also actually occurs for the, the Senate, the Senate the Chancellorship and the Jedi Council all seem to be separate authorities. It is alluded to several times that Palpatine controls the Senate, but we don't actually even know what that means because uh, the Senate in itself, beyond the Naboo situation, is actually a very underdeveloped concept. Um, but here, it should be emphasized that the Senate is the collection of all of these planets. And so centralization of the GATT of the Republic would by extension mean confirming the Senate's approval of Palpatine's chancellorship. And indeed, as we see in A New Hope, Palpatine then goes further in not counting any sort of attempts of the Senate to reassert its power, i.e. the localities, the uh, planets deciding to gang up on the central administration then you create the Death Star. Indeed, if you remember, in the film, the original film, Attack of the Clones, um, Dooku shows a holographic image of um, a holographic image of the Death Star, and one wonders why. You know, what, how on earth does this sort of relate to anything which is going on between the separatist movement? And of course, it seems to be a not so subtle allusion to what is going to happen, even though it doesn't make any sense. So moving on from Palpatine's diplomatic ability, um, in this redraft, it is unambiguous that Palpatine has integrated and subordinated the Jedi into his war machine. Originally, Palpatine was dependent on the Jedi for their tactical experience. However, as the war has waged on, regular Republic soldiers have been promoted as officers. Yoda and the Jedi assumed at the outbreak of hostilities that they would have the exclusive right to command, and this plays into the whole power dynamic situation. But now, Palpatine has promoted non-force users as generals and admirals. Moreover, the Republic officers can be replaced, but the Jedi cannot, owing to the fact it takes so long to train them. And of course, uh, the Jedi are dying very quickly, and it'll probably take generations in order to replace the Jedi at the number they had before the Clone Wars. One of those officers, which I'm going to introduce, which it's not simply a matter of fan service, this is actually... I would say a very important decision to make, and I would say a bizarre omission from the original prequels, because one of those officers is none other than Tarkin, later Grand Moff Tarkin, who is the commander of the Death Star, uh, played by um, David Cushing, uh, or Peter Cushing, um, in film four. The first non-force user to be promoted to the rank of Admiral. The Jedi obviously are steadily losing their influence, and this is exacerbating a general sense of paranoia. Maul being a clone has major implications for the way the clone wars are fought. As he is simultaneously the war leader and template for the clones, it is impossible for nominal, normal Republic forces to actually find him. The only thing that separates Maul from the clones is his false sensitivity, making him susceptible to the Jedi. In the original film, we see Grievous displaying his collection of lightsabers from the Jedi he has felled. 
Here, Maul exhibits the same thing from all the Jedi sent to assassinate him, only to fail. He regularly duels with two lightsabers or even his traditional double-bladed lightsaber. Seldom, however, does he ever exhibit force powers in regular combat or positions of command, lest he gives himself away. By contrast, the Republic is forced to play place more and more Jedi on the front lines in large clone engagements, which significantly increases their casualties. And this is for the sake of finding Darth Maul. But of course, all of this does play into Darth Maul's hands, put the Jedi on the front lines, kill them more quickly. And indeed, Maul, despite not being in any way allied to Palpatine, is actually helping Palpatine along by removing the Jedi as a consideration for his future plans at galactic consolidation. Here, the mission to find and assassinate Maul is far more complex and hopefully more interesting than the original plot to kill Grievous, which is just send him off to a planet and then Obi-Wan drops into the middle of a droid sort of army sector with Grievous there and they don't just murder him there and then. Anakin and Obi-Wan together are on Kashyyyk and they finally manage to hunt down and kill Maul, leading to the Separatist endgame. Padme is now entering the late stages of pregnancy and having being on Kashyyyk with her detachment from Naboo, returns to Naboo, entrusting the Naboo army to Anakin. Anakin then returns to Coruscant, as was stated in the original redraft, with plans to strategize the end of the war. After the Battle of Kashyyyk, Dooku is not, surprisingly, elated at the loss of his enemy Maul, but certain now that the Separatist cause is doomed if things continue on the way they have. When Maul was alive, he spoke to Dooku about Pelagius, that Pelagius had briefly referenced an apprentice who had gone rogue during the original invasion of Naboo. Dooku pieces together a series of intelligence breaches that account for the recent string of defeats. The Separatist leaders begin major political and military purges to remove potential saboteurs to no effect. With much of the clone army destroyed and now more dead, the Nemoidian sovereign approaches Dooku to ask why he shouldn't start negotiations with Palpatine, given Palpatine's rather generous offers to other systems. Unable, unable to provide an answer, Dooku appeals to the dark side aspect of Palpatine for advice and further training, this being the dark side aspect who he was introduced to uh, in Attack of the Clones, in the redraft, uh, for the purposes of allowing him originally uh, to exert more control over the separatist movements and actually find a way of killing uh, Maul. That dark side aspect then went away and abducted uh, Armadala and Anakin. So Dooku up until this point has no reason to distrust this aspect. And but of course, throughout the entire war, he has been relaying advice to this dark side aspect, who is of course Palpatine, which means Palpatine has always been privy to the battle plans of both the Republic and the Separatists. After this particular meeting regarding the Nemoidian situation, uh, Dooku is informed that the Nemoidians have betrayed the Separatists and negotiated with Palpatine. Dooku then recalls the conversation with Maul and remembers that Palpatine had fled Naboo with the Jedi in the Phantom Menace. And here he deduces that how on earth could the Nemoidians have been detached from the Separatist Alliance so quickly, so swiftly, unless Dooku had been talking directly to Palpatine or someone very close to Palpatine to relay that information to allow Palpatine to then go over and quickly detach that and break the alliance. Um, indeed, you can say that this is actually a flaw from Palpatine's point of view, because Palpatine is the late stages of victory. You know, it, it looks obvious that he's going to win. And you can say this is a rare moment of being careless. And there are going to be other moments in this draft of him being careless as well. Uh, but that has rather severe implications for him, because Dooku summons the dark side aspect one last time and accuses it of being Pelagius's rogue former apprentice, she Palpatine. Taken completely by surprise, Palpatine is captured there and then by Dooku, which establishes the plot around Dooku and the Separatist fleet 
coming to Coruscant and attempting to precipitate the end of the Republic by announcing that the Supreme Chancellor Palpatine is in fact a Sith Lord who has been playing both sides of the conflict all along. Indeed, it should be emphasized to the Jedi that he is a Sith, but also to the Republic that he essentially had been influencing the provocation of the original Clone Wars to begin with. And indeed, this goes all the way back to him and his negotiations at the beginning of the Clone Wars, the attack of the clones, uh, where he had provoked the um, uh, Pearl Harbor-esque attack on Coruscant, uh, which was led by the Darth Maul clones. But moving on, when the Jedi are grounded by Ki Mundi, leaving Anakin as the sole Jedi to aid in the rescue of Palpatine, Tarkin is the Republic Admiral who accompanies him and engages the Separatist fleet. Thereby, we finally have established a relationship between the two. And this is a relationship which is going to presumably uh, grow and blossom during the time between the films. And of course, we see the culmination of their relationship in their professional standing as Empire Admiral, or in this case, Grand Moff Sector Commander of the Death Star, and Darth Vader as the Sith Apprentice of the Emperor. And indeed, you can almost say that this um, accounts for the, uh, the relative sort of rank imbalance between the two, in the sense that Tarkin is a protege of the new Imperial Force. Um, he is the first ever non-Force user to be appointed as Admiral of a republic of a republic fleet and then empire fleet and this you can say also solidifies his relationship with tarkin's relationship with palpatine because now as with anakin tarkin and anakin have a role in terms of being able to um, rescue him and save his life so while tarkin attacks the main fleet tarkin orders vader anakin not yet vader to go on the mission to rescue the Chancellor specifically, while Tarkin is able to win the battle above the above Coruscant. Upon finally reaching Dooku, Anakin, who is still essentially a, just a Jedi or a rogue Jedi, a Ronin at this point, has no intention of killing Dooku. Though Dooku maimed Anakin and also let him live at the end of the Attack of the Clones um, rewrite, um, that is one aspect, he has forgiven Dooku for that. But also, a live Dooku could be an asset in creating a lasting peace, as Anakin has his own agency as reference and his own views on the future of the Republic. Dooku, however, is fatalistic, and he will not allow for Palpatine to escape under any circumstances. During the fight, Dooku realizes he is not strong enough to defeat Anakin, and so then goes out of his way to murder Palpatine. Palpatine, by the way, has reverted to his non-force sensitive appearance for Anakin's benefit. And it should be noted that obviously from the dark side aspect to the full embodiment of dark side Sidious, which the audience isn't privy to, hasn't seen it yet. Um, obviously he can still use his force powers, but I'm taking a device which is used in the Revenge of the Sith, which are the ray shields, which immobilize them, and basically say this is the version of um, uh, Force Oppressant, essentially. And they're also the, um, the cuffs you see in Return of the Jedi, which Sidious removes, which presumably prevent Luke from using the Force in the Emperor's throne room. So there are many ways you can say that Dooku has the ability to um, prevent Palpatine using any sort of um, hostile sort of force powers or abilities, but of course not to the extent that he can remove Palpatine's passive ability to shield essentially his true appearance from Anakin. Um, and of course this is infuriating for Dooku because it still means that Palpatine can manipulate Anakin into doing what he wants. It is the act of Dooku attempting to murder Palpatine, which fundamentally changes Anakin's outlook towards Dooku, and he channels the dark side through his rage to crush Dooku. When Anakin kills a maimed and disarmed Dooku, 
It is in direct contrast to Dooku having spared his life at the end of Attack of the Clones, and this is a definitive fall. Yet Anakin has not pledged himself as a Sith for Palpatine because he hasn't revealed his true identity, nor does he become a Sith after he then goes on down on the planet and kills Mace Windu to save Palpatine's life. As far as Anakin is concerned, he is serving Palpatine and the Republic while burning his bridges with the Jedi Council. Now, stealing an idea from Red Letter Media, visually, Coruscant has been wrecked with prop by poverty by the time of Revenge of the Sith. So essentially, the sort of greater amount of uh, traffic on Coruscant, uh, you know, shops have closed down, places are boarded up, there's uh, endemic crime, people are impoverished, and this is in contrast to the pristine Jedi Temple, so as to add a visual contrast between the lynch mobs and the besieged Jedi. And of course, this is footage from Revenge of the Sith. Get rid of the marching orders of the clones and instead replace them by a um, incensed and disorderly mob. And this actually plays into the whole Yoda is captured uh, plot that was in the redraft. I'm going to explain it here. Yoda orders the Jedi not to engage the lynch mobs, except in self-defense, as he will not permit tensions between the people and the Jedi to be further inflamed by the killing of civilians. But this isn't just a political decision, this is also a moral decision, that these are civilians who are basically, he considers being duped into this action by Palpatine, and it is not justified for the Jedi essentially to go out by just murdering um, uh, non-combatants, um, Essentially, well, they are combatants now, but civilians indiscriminately, because he believes they're essentially misguided. And it is amid the sacking of the temple that Yoda organizes a desperate evacuation of the Jedi remainder, including Obi-Wan and Kiadi Mundi. But Yoda remains behind as the captain of the ship until all the Jedi are evacuated, which ultimately ends in Yoda's capture. Imprisoned, Yoda is kept behind ray shields, as seen in the original, as seen in the original film, to negate his force usage, while the Chancellor comes to visit him. Palpatine informs Yoda that many Jedi have been captured, including the younglings, and proposes that Yoda give him the locations of all the other Jedi. In return, Palpatine promises that the trained Jedi will be disarmed and quarantined on a remote planet, perhaps so they can become one with the Force and also not allowed to breed, which is consistent with the Jedi's practice on celibacy, while the younglings will be returned to their original families and the orphans will be sent to new families. Should Yoda refuse this offer, Palpatine will then have all of them executed. Palpatine, even now, is still concealing his Force sensitivity to Yoda. So while Yoda has been given the information by Dooku, he is not entirely convinced that Palpatine is a Sith in the way Kiadi Mundi was so eager to believe. Yoda and Palpatine had, in fact, forged a constructive relationship during the Clone Wars. Palpatine was attacked by Mace Windu, not vice versa. And the temple was attacked by a lynch mob and not Palpatine's galactic army. There is a part of Yoda also that wishes to be reconciled with Anakin. Therefore, Yoda reluctantly concedes to Palpatine's offer and gives up the locations. Palpatine then approaches Tarkin and executes Order 66. Again, historical analogies here, Knight of Long Knives, destruction of the Templars, what have you. All the Jedi in captivity are executed and the rest are hunted down throughout the galaxy. And I also like the idea of Tarkin personally being responsible for the execution of Order 66, because again, this would be entirely consistent with his use of the Death Star. He is trained and he is the sort of supreme representative of using cold, calculating force to instantly remove any sort of hint of opposition. Um, and again, that further develops Tarkin's character. And um, again, I, I would say, informs so much of what the audience perception of him, of him is going into A New Hope. Um, so again, I don't really understand why this order was essentially given to um, uh, faceless clones, not faceless in a literal sense, but faceless in that they're all interchangeable. Um, 
I, I don't exactly know what the law justification is. I've here heard that the clones were essentially programmed to execute Order 66 um, because apparently they don't have any free will. So having Tarkin do it and having normal soldiers do it, I think, is far more effective, but what have you. Um, Obi-Wan, of course, had escaped thanks to um, Yoda's heroic efforts at the temple and has fled to Naboo. And this makes him far harder to kill for Tarkin and the army, as Naboo was never integrated into the Republic army. Though Naboo and its army is nominally under Anakin's command, Padme is still commander-in-chief as its queen, and she offers Obi-Wan her protection. Anakin is then given the mission to kill Kiadi Mundi on Mustafa. And this is because Mustafa was intentionally chosen as a refuge spot for Kiadi Mundi because it was in nowhere near any sort of populated installations of the Republic army. Um, but of course, now Yoda has given away the information, so Palpatine knows to send Anakin there on a mission to kill him. On the boo, Padme discovers a series of messages between Palpatine and her father, referring back to the original uh, film where she had become queen because of the suspicious death of her father. She also sees messages between Palpatine and an unknown figure. And finally, one scrap with Palpatine and Pelagius. This leads her to surmise that Palpatine helped orchestrate the attack on the boo and was possibly behind the death of her father. Padme's discovery of this is intercut alongside a dramatic scene between Yoda and Palpatine. Yoda has felt a huge disturbance in the Force to the extent that he is almost paralyzed by all the death of the Jedi. And again, we see this somewhat visually with Yoda on Kashyyyk before the clone troopers attempt to assassinate him. Palpatine approaches Yoda and confesses about Order 66, gloating to Yoda that the Jedi are dead and all memory of the Jedi and that sad old religion will be condemned to oblivion. Having absolutely no reason to hold back now that Palpatine has achieved all of his aims, he informs Yoda that he will be named Galactic Emperor and that the whole galaxy will be united under the Sith. Palpatine then releases the ray shields and electrocutes Yoda, revealing for the first time to Yoda and to the audience his horrific features as a Sith, bearing in mind that he has never been shown in his hood or even told Anakin about his true identity. The dark side aspect of Palpatine displayed to Count Dooku was essentially a wraith, the same wraith who abducted Anakin and Padme at the end of the Clone Wars rewrite. As Palpatine uses his Force powers passively to shield his presence from the Jedi, the dark aspect of Palpatine is the total inverse, disguising himself by appearing as nothing but dark side energy. Both forms leave Palpatine ineffective in combat compared to his default monstrous form that is finally revealed to Yoda. Essentially, he can't engage in compact and sustain the passive ability simultaneously. Nevertheless, Palpatine, in a moment of hubris, has underestimated Yoda and Yoda's Jedi training. And what was intended to be a scene reminiscent of the torture scene of Luke in Return of the Jedi turns into an epic force battle without the use of lightsabers. The lack of night lightsabers is a nod to Yoda's training without one on Dagobah, training of Luke, and Palpatine's derision in Return of the Jedi towards Luke's Jedi weapon. But ultimately, this is to add action variety, which was demonstrated somewhat in the original film with the Senate battle scene, when they're uh, using electricity, as you can see here, Yoda is repelling it, and Palpatine is attempting to uh, murder Yoda with those um, uh, floating Senate seats. But ultimately, unlimited power Palpatine, which is demonstrated here, something I desperately wanted to get into this draft, um, and feared of lo losing it in the uh, the original fix in the prequel stream. There's every reason for this to exist, but ultimately unlimited power Palpatine proves to be stronger than a much weakened Yoda, and Yoda is forced to escape to Naboo. Yoda arrives at Naboo, wounded and defeated, and confirms Padme's worst fears about Palpatine. Padme already having come to the conclusion that Palpatine was possibly responsible for the invasion of Naboo and the death of her father. In the meantime, 
Padme has given birth to Luke and Leia. During Palpatine's taunting of Yoda, he revealed that Anakin will soon return from executing Kiadi Mundi, at which point Palpatine will formally confirm Anakin as his Sith apprentice and successor to the Empire. Padme, Obi-Wan and Yoda agree that they must reach Kiadi Mundi before Anakin, then confront Anakin about Palpatine. Then perhaps the four remaining Jedi and the army of Naboo can hold out against the Empire. Yoda, however, is too weak and will stay on Naboo to watch over the twins. Anakin reaches Mustafa first and tracks Kiadi Mundi. Anakin is startled that Kiadi doesn't draw his lightsaber and calls Mundi a coward. Kiadi Mundi then calmly apologizes for any transgression he has committed against Anakin personally. He laments Anakin's fall to the dark side. He assumes responsibility for the destruction of the Jedi and indeed intimates that he was concerned about politics over the way of the Force and accepts his death as finally becoming one with the Force. Very similar to Obi-Wan in The New Hope where Darth Vader kills him, he simply disappears. You know, if you strike me down, I will become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. And of course, in the similar situation, Anakin, without any remorse, given everything this character has attempted to do to him, and given the fact that he has already killed so many Jedi, he's already killed Dooku, he's already killed Mace Windu, um, ultimately has satisfaction in killing Kiadi Mundi. However, in all of these drafts, Kiadi Mundi has been a de facto secondary antagonist to many, if not all, of the main characters from Yoda to Padme, despite his apparent steadfastness to the Jedi Code. And this death scene, which wasn't included in the original redraft, is intended to partially rehabilitate and contextualize his actions, redeeming aspects of his character before he is ultimately executed. It is then that Obi-Wan and Padme arrive on Mustafar to meet Anakin, who celebrates his execution of Akiadi Mundi openly as a mortal enemy of the Republic and its chancellor, soon to be emperor. Padme and Obi-Wan reveal that Palpatine was behind it all since the invasion of Naboo. He is a Sith, he murdered Padme's father, and he murdered all of the Jedi, including the younglings. Information that they are privy to, thanks to Yoda's escape. Anakin declares that Obi-Wan has turned Padme against him and draws his lightsaber. When Padme intercedes, an enraged Anakin strikes her in a moment of madness. Instantly reflecting on his action, Anakin is horrified and tearful, as he believes he has killed Padme before lashing out sadistically at Obi-Wan. The fight then proceeds as in the film with one exception. Obi-Wan believes Anakin to have died rather than leaving him to a slow, agonizing, painful death, as there is no reason in this draft why Obi-Wan wouldn't want to show mercy to Anakin who has in effect been duped by Palpatine and has just lost the love of his life. With no news of Anakin, Palpatine travels to Mustafa and discovers an incinerated Anakin who is still barely alive. Only when Anakin survives surgery and has become encased in his armor does he wait to see Palpatine as Sidious in his Sith form. In public, Palpatine will continue to assume his serene, benign appearance for the benefit of his imperial subjects, and indeed the Senate, though he will dispense with that image in private, as with the return of the Jedi. Anakin is terrified and disgusted by Palpatine's true appearance, but Palpatine rushes to comfort him, saying that he had saved his life and that Obi-Wan had returned to Naboo to murder his children before escaping with Yoda. Indeed, the demonstration of the Sifified Palpatine up until this point, I think, is a ultimate revelation to Anakin of exactly what he has surrendered to, what he has been fighting for this entire time, what essentially led to the death of his wife, the destruction of the Jedi, and now, as he is Emperor, the end of the Republic. Anakin is physically and emotionally broken, and Anakin submits to the Emperor, who bestows upon him the epithet of Darth Vader, his new Sith apprentice. Nathan and I struggled over the best analogy for Vader. The prequel Anakin that Lucas envisaged is very much a Faustian character, obsessed with power, who makes a deal with the devil to grant him the ability to save the ones he loves. 
Nathan was very much trying to keep Vader consistent with Lucas's original vision. However, my intention was to keep Vader consistent with the character established in the original trilogy, a fallen soldier and instrument of the Emperor. Indeed, I don't believe that the prequel Anakin deserves that moment of redemption in Return of the Jedi. And had he been responsible for the deaths of the younglings in order to charge up his dark side power so he could heal Padme, especially not. So faced with Lucas's vision in the prequels versus Lucas's already established character, I will go for the latter for the sake of consistency, lest there is a glaring character contradiction, which I believe there is in the films. Indeed, I find it very difficult to assume that Hayden Christensen is Darth Vader. Anakin, therefore, is not a Faust, um, but a Turin Turambar, if I'm going to use Tolkien, or Oedipus, an honourable man who believes in the righteousness of his actions only to discover that he has done terrible things, and as a consequence, blinds himself, or as the case of Vader, becomes encased in a suit of armour. Indeed, you can say dead to life. As Vader's through line is slavery, he begins as a slave only to be rescued, in quotes, by the Jedi. Thereafter, he has to grapple with his adherence to the Jedi Code and the wishes of the Jedi Council, his love for Padme, and his loyalty to the Chancellor and the Republic. Ultimately, he chooses the latter, only to become enslaved to the will of the new Emperor and encased in armour as if it were an Iron Maiden. And for people who don't know what an Iron Maiden is, it's that traditional me torture mechanism where you're encased uh, in a essentially a a metal device which has spikes on the on the interior. I mean, you must know what I'm talking about. Only then, saving his son Luke and killing the Emperor, does Anakin Vader finally become free and become one with the Force. That is the consistent arc that I was trying to keep from episode one through to episode six. Obi-Wan and a mortally wounded Padme, who, like Anakin, surviving the attack on Mustafa, she is knocked out, she is mortally wounded, but she survives for now. The wounded Padme returns to Naboo. Against Padme and the Jedi's best laid plans, Naboo is now without its queen and its constable general Anakin, and stands no chance against the Empire. Palpatine had always feared Padme, and would no doubt see, at least in the minds of Padme and the Jedi, that her children would become political obstacles to overcome. Indeed, it is possible that they may be killed so that Darth Vader doesn't come looking for them. Indeed, you can almost say an incredibly cynical ploy. Because Darth Vader still has that connection to Naboo, because he is still loved by the Naboo army, and because his children are to reign over Naboo, that were Sidious actually to think about this, it makes complete sense to murder the children in order to sever Anakin Darth Vader's links to Naboo to keep him entirely subordinated to the Emperor. That's how sadistic Palpatine is, so we can expect that he would do that. And indeed, Vader already believes that he's killed his wife, and the Chancellor has said that Obi-Wan is responsible for the death of his children. At Padme's deathbed stand her allies in the Republic, including Bail Organa, Yoda, Obi-Wan. Organa and the other senators form a covenant to protect her children from the Emperor, and they plan to leave Naboo forever. And it is this covenant which is the forerunner for the rebellion, which will ultimately um, result in the death of Palpatine. So Anakin is responsible for the rise of the Galactic Empire, and you can see Padme and her independent policy for Naboo is the forerunner for the rebellion. They are the different sides of one coin, essentially. But there's one point I want to leave this, which is actually talking about a meta point regarding the plots of all of these films and why I've actually been so invested in coming up with all these ideas and trying to improve these films from a writing perspective, um, which is actually to talk about George Lucas and the music of Star Wars. Because Partly as a result of, you can say, the Plinkett reviews, so much of the criticism regarding the prequels has focused on superficial elements in the writing, like the terrible dialogue, the bad direction, uh, the overuse of green screens, um, 
regarding the aesthetic, I believe there is actually a decent aesthetic demonstrated throughout the films, um, at least in terms of um, things which are sort of uh, memorable, which is why I believe it had such an enduring impression compared to the sequel films who really have no um, uh, enduring sort of uh, lasting sort of memorable aspects of aesthetics. I know that's an incredibly kind of convoluted way of saying that, but hopefully you understand what I mean. Uh, there are some major exceptions, I would say, to this. I would say the uniforms of the Jedi uh, hold it back significantly. Um, obviously, one can say reduce the use of green screen, especially when it comes to, I don't know, Mace Windu interacting with the clone troopers. Um, indeed, make them real people. Don't make them all uh, completely interchangeable. Um, but really, that to me, all that criticism is more superficial because I want to leave this conversation on a positive note, which is to talk about the music. I believe that the original trilogy is iconic, partly because of Macquarie's um, concept art. But of course, that's leaving out John Williams's um, musical score. But I think there's a tendency to give all of the credit to John Williams. Indeed, I think that's very much the impression people have when looking at the uh, looking at the prequel scores and looking at um, the Battle of Heroes and the Duel of the Fates. However, Lucas was responsible essentially for the whole. Um, uh, you can say the whole sort of uh, background as to what he wanted the music to be in the context of the story, because Star Wars isn't really a sci-fi saga. It is a fantasy soap opera and uh, Lucas has pretty much said as much and so the music is not reminiscent of sci-fi even though Lucas has admitted that uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey was a major inspiration rather the music from Lucas's perspective was inspired by later romantic early modernist classical music so take for example uh, Gustav Holst which is very much an evidence when you talk about um, uh, the Imperial March, uh, Prokofiev, so talking about uh, Soviet-era music, uh, Igor Stravinsky, and of course Richard Strauss. But in terms of the use of leitmotifs, the entire aspect is Wagnerian. So why am I pointing to this? Well, Lucas essentially formed the bedrock for what he wanted the music to be in these films. And John Williams took Lucas's suggestions and he weaved together incredible scores. Now. The reason I'm so invested in the ideas coming out of the sequels rather than the prequels rather than the execution is because I believe the brilliance of all of these ideas actually shines through in the music. Why is it that the prequels have such incredible and amazing music that everyone references and can't really counter against and then no one can remember the sequel um, soundtrack other than what was lifted from the soundtrack from the originals? Um, even in the latest film, uh, The Rise of Skywalker, Jewel of the Fates, I believe, was briefly referenced in that. And it's because I believe that music almost has ability to communicate these ideas, which transcends any of the writing or the visual aesthetics, how clumsily they were essentially presented. And so deep down, you may decry Lucas, you may say he was completely out of his depth, and I will always go on record to say that Lucas is Nadia is when it comes to character development. But I think because the music is so memorable compared to so many sci-fi and action generic sort of scores is actually a testament to what you can say would be um, a Wagnerian or Schopenhauer-esque element, which is that in the total work of art, you have the acting, you have the costumes, you have the, in Wagner will be the poetic, um, the, the poetry of the actual words, the dialogue, but all of this is sublimated to the music. So in many senses, you can actually look to Star Wars as music dramas. And as with Wagner, the highest themes are basically communicated with the music. And I believe in Star Wars, this is also the case, that we can almost see them as music dramas. And so I am very much invested not in the superficial aspects which everyone rightly criticizes i'm not going to um be that i'm not going to be that contrarian here um but as stemming from the music my focus has been on the translation of the ideas taking lucas's original conception of star wars and trying to actually 
you can almost say that this is, you know, a, a beautiful sort of um, marble structure, which is just still encased in stone. Um, if, if I'm trying to come up, I think it was Michelangelo said that uh, the sculpture is already, already there. It is simply a matter of me teasing it out slowly. So as with the general ideas, as with the music, what I hope I have done with um, Nathan's contributions with the Fix and the Prequel stream is actually show a version of the prequel films um, which demonstrates the themes of galactic revolution, the major philosophical and religious disputes within the Jedi, and indeed the tragic fall and transition of these uh, far more developed characters. So thank you everyone for watching.